If you haven't watched part one covering just what fascism is, I would highly recommend watching that before we get into this part. So for those of you who haven't seen it, it's linked above right now for you to go ahead and watch. And if you've already seen it, then let's get right into it. Now, I must say that this, like many ideas about fascism, is not universally accepted and argued about heavily. But there does tend to be a major overlap in the rise of fascist movements as a response to socialist ones. Now, maybe you could chalk that up to radicalization across the board during times of economic or societal upheaval, but it is crystal clear that the wealthy elites would prefer a fascist dictatorship over any chance for a socialist government. Fascism is inherently deceptive. It appeals to the elites as a way for them to maintain wealth and power, and to the working class by corrupting socialist rhetoric, turning words like capitalists into Jews, or the banking system into a global Jewish conspiracy theory, creating a scapegoat for the working class to stay angry at, while allowing the actual rich to maintain their wealth, incorporating them into their movement. There is both historical and modern precedent for this rise in fascist movements in response to socialist ones. Historically, the king of Italy and most of Europe's old aristocracy, after seeing the fall of the Tsarist regime to the Bolsheviks, caused by the societal upheaval of the failings of World War I, led to radicalization across the board. The elite saw Mussolini in his black shirts as a better alternative to socialism, and when the Prime Minister of Italy asked the king to bring in the army to smash Mussolini's march on Rome with his 30,000 black shirts, the king effectively sanctioned Mussolini to come into Rome and take control of the state, appointing him Prime Minister. Out of his and the rest of the ruling class's fear of socialism coming to power, the king for his part still got to stay in a figurehead position and maintain his lavish lifestyle. So it made sense for the ruling hierarchy, the elites, to open their arms to the fascists over the perceived alternative of a socialist threat. Another good example historically is that the main reason for the Spanish Civil War was a reaction to the rise of socialists, communists, and anarchists inside the Spanish parliament. With them winning the 1936 election with their Popular Front coalition beating the previously empowered Nationalist coalition, this promoted a reaction by the far-right coalition of phalangists, monarchists, conservatives, traditionalists, and industry executives to go ahead and remake and expand upon a fascist military dictatorship, which they called the Nationalists, similar to the previous right-wing military dictatorship of Rivera before the Second Spanish Republic that would be much more friendly to businesses than the Republicans would. Republicans in this aspect, meaning the left-wing Republican faction, made up of liberal capitalist groups, communists, and socialists in their coalition with the anarchists, who mostly broke away in regions such as Catalonia, but still fought the nationalists in a loose coalition, with some infighting with the Popular Front. Video on that linked right now. And while you may argue that the fascist phalangists were somehow left-winged, I would respond with the fact that they respected private property, were starkly anti-communist, <laughs> wanted society organized into strict social hierarchies, which socialists despise, and scholarly views place the idea ideology on the far right. The right-wing coalition revolt in Spain, backed by fascist Italy and the Nazis, was done as a response to the rise of socialists and communists, democratically elected to the government. Of course, after the fascists won, the government implemented many policies that would help industry executives, such as economic cooperation pacts with governments like the US since post-World War II. They were seen as a stark ally against the Soviets, and what happened once Francisco Franco, the last surviving fascist, died? The government with the help of the monarchy reverted right back into a liberal democracy, since the threat of the socialists and communists were seen as gone to the wealthy elites. But make no mistake, once the threat returns, a second wave of this fascist sentiment will return. And looking at the rise of extremism across the globe, it seems that it is returning. I originally had a six-page essay on Viktor Orban's Hungary, going into many of his neo-fascist roots. But I think instead, in order to explain this massive growth of neo-fascism in the world today, I should go over the growth of emerging hyper-nationalistic reactionary movements within the West, compared to growing social and economic upheavals. So in order to do this, I'll be going over two emerging movements that have gained popularity rapidly due to recent upheavals and compare them to the growing leftist causes in those same countries. And before I start this off, I think I should note that these groups that I'm going over are not necessarily fascist. They may have growing sections 
factions within these parties that have neo-fascist sympathies, and that's what I'm going to go over. Similar to how Hitler caucused with conservative groups to gain power, the same thing is happening in these groups. And while these parties in general have already had a heavy nationalistic past and had its fringe members in the past, these members are starting to become less and less fringe and more and more commonplace, with a simple escalation in rhetoric after each successive right-wing populist leader. Now you could chalk this up to an overall radicalization across the board, but why does this radicalization happen in the first place? Well, it's because of social and economic upheavals that cause a disillusionment of the current system and the people, leading to two options for the working class, right-wing or left-wing populism. As stated earlier, fascism co-opts socialist language but never actually follows through on these promises. For instance, in Nazi Germany from 1933 to 1939, wages fell. The number of work hours rose by 15%, serious accidents in factories increased, and workers could be blacklisted by employers if they attempted to question their working conditions. Monopolies, which Nazis had promised to tackle, were in control of over 70% of total production, with the average hourly wage going from 109, sorry in advance for this pronunciation, Fenix, in 1931, to 78.7 Fenix, in 1938. And because of this, during times of extreme upheaval, those with the wealth have to choose between a group they despise, seeing them as a threat to their extreme lavish luxury, and one that they can tolerate and even excel within as long as they aren't critical of the state. With the writing seemingly on the wall, if the economic or social crisis does not end, the rich end up choosing and aligning with the fascists, the ones that they can tolerate, and dump money into their laps to be used for propaganda, and to ensure electoral success. The overall rich will resort to more nationalistic measures in order to maintain their wealth. And even though some may initially try to stick with liberal capitalism instead of flipping to this radical nationalism, this flip from liberal capitalism to nationalistic fervor isn't a concerted effort. This simply happens person by person, each one making their own decisions, choosing their own selfish interests because they want to maintain their wealth, and possibly even believing in the fear-mongering that they've created about leftist groups. The groups we're going to be talking about are the non-establishment sections of the Tories in the UK, along with UKIP, now Reform, and the Republicans in the US. Now I know this is going to get controversial, so if you don't like that then well, why did you click on a video about political ideology? I mainly chose these two groups given that I have the most knowledge on these groups, and that most of you guys being from these countries can relate and understand these groups easier than say the politics of Cambodia. Sorry to all my Cambodian viewers. I also think that while I could bring up groups like Law and Order in Poland or Fidesz in Hungary, going further and further right, the US and the UK have historically mirrored each other in politics, and show a really interesting view into the current radicalization on the right that we have seen going on since at least the 80s, if not earlier, just ramping up since this period of over a decade of upheavals. First let's go over what has caused this radicalization. There there are at least two economic and two social upheavals that have happened over this period. Starting with the 2008 recession, the migrant and US immigration crisis, the BLM movement, and the current COVID recession. This quadruple whammy of shock to the system has caused both sides of the aisle to reevaluate and become disillusioned with the current system. But this isn't an equal disillusionment. I know I'll get hell for this in the comments, but the disillusionment on the left has been justified, while the right has just doubled down on their nationalism, which has really accelerated since 9-11 and the war on terror. I also have to state that the BLM movement was and is justified, but trust me, while I could get into that right now, that's a whole video on its own, and I don't want to steer this video too far off course. The shocks to our economic system from 2008 and COVID have showed that capitalism needs to be bailed out every decade in order to even function with the people footing the bill while the rich only get richer. And the migrant crisis that the US and UK caused due to the fear of commies taking over and imperialism in general has led to the right burying their heads in the sand and completely ignoring why these immigrants are coming in the first place. Almost like the US and UK overthrew in the US's case democratically elected leftist governments and colonized the shit out of these regions creating their current horrible borders and conditions in the UK's and other European powers cases. Not that the UK hasn't done some over throwing of their own. These upheavals have created a massive increase in radicalization and partisanship over the past decade. And because of that, we can see that due to a justified outcry from the left, a reaction has taken place to double down on the right and to stoke the fires of nationalism. Figures like Bernie Sanders in the US, a mild social democrat that calls himself a democratic socialist, still love him though, and Jeremy Corbyn in the UK, an actual democratic socialist, have triggered extreme responses from both the right and the liberal capitalists in charge of these parties. Not that the US and UK haven't had extensive histories of red baiting before, especially during the Cold
World War. With these supposed leftist groups doing everything in their power to replace them as the front runners of their party. In the US with all other moderates dropping out right before Super Tuesday. And with Warren the second furthest left staying in until just after Super Tuesday. Siphoning off votes and not backing Bernie after she dropped out. And if that's not enough, the 2016 DNC hack clearly showed the party's implicit bias wanting to do everything in their power to make sure that a mild social democrat running on a populist platform didn't become their presidential candidate. The UK had a similar situation with Jeremy Corbyn, where Sanders was replaced with Biden. Corbyn was replaced with Sir Keir Starmer, because while there certainly were some legitimate anti-Semitic remarks within Labour, a YouGov poll has shown that the Tories are 8% more likely to support anti-Semitic remarks than Labour, though of course any anti-Semitic remarks are bad. However, due to this, the established media's focus on these issues have pointed out issues within Labour that should be acknowledged, but refuse to point out the much worse and growing anti-Semitism within the Tories that have been growing due to nationalistic endeavors like Brexit. This is also due to Corbyn fairly criticizing the state of Israel for its treatment of the Palestinians, triggering a response by the established right who backed this conservative Israeli state, saying that mentioning the unfair treatment of Palestinians by Israel is anti-Semitic. Hell, the media even tried to do the same thing against Bernie Sanders, a Jewish man, who came out against the same treatment of Palestinians by Israel, with the media trying to label him as anti-Semitic. Not that of course there aren't people that act as Uncle Tom's, <coughs> Candace Owens, <coughs> Sorry about that. But this was certainly not that because being against the Israeli apartheid treatment of Palestinians is not the same as being against Jewish people. But because of this crisis in labor played up by the media, the Democratic Socialist Corbyn lost the 2019 election bad, helped by the anti-Corbyn establishment labor officials who helped lose the general election to oust Corbyn, which leaked emails help us show, with an election night chat log that showed that 45 minutes after the exit poll revealed that labor had overturned the conservative majority in parliament, one senior official said the result was the opposite to what I had been working towards for the last couple years, describing themselves and their allies as silent and gray-faced and in need of counseling. Another one said, we have to be upbeat and not show it, while a third one told the group that everyone needs to smile, describing the result as awful. Another very senior party official said that it was going to be a long night. And when one YouGov poll showed Labour up in the campaign, one member said, I actually felt quite sick when I saw that YouGov poll last night. This is not the rhetoric you would think members within your own party would have to hearing that you are likely to win, even though of course they didn't. This shows that the establishment of the party would much rather have conservative control of the government over their own party. These examples show how a mild social democrat and a democratic socialist were chucked out of their parties and sabotaged by those within them because mild liberal capitalists couldn't handle the simplest of reforms spurred by these upheavals allowing a ratchet effect. And how did the right wing of these governments respond during these elections? They went further into nationalist rhetoric, with the Tories doubling down on the clusterfuck of Brexit. Uh, this European Union is the new communism. And I could go in depth into Brexit also, but I can only get so far off topic for one video. But maybe one day I'll cover that situation. But undoubtedly that was a nationalistic and right wing populist measure with Boris Johnson being a slightly less bad British Trump. But to be fair, this has happened before with prior escalations. Hate crimes have also steadily increased in England since Brexit, spurred by this nationalism with the right using them as a clear other, increasing by more than double since 2012. Now back to the US, events like the rejection of a fair election, causing the right to implement new undemocratic voter restrictions and a literal riot in the capital, which shows a clear fervor added with new nationalist groups like the America First Caucus in Congress, which has even been described by the Republican House Minority Leader as nativist dog whistle, which I mean he's not wrong, added with similar growing hate crimes in the US, especially against Asians, with people using them as a COVID scapegoat. Because I'm real sure the guy bagging your groceries from Japan had a shit ton to do with the outbreak of a virus due to shitty animal market sanitation in China. And with modern conspiracy theories dredging up the same rhetoric as the Nazis, you can see how the comparison between the two is apt. Because of these upheavals, if they don't get resolved, and given the current flaws of the system and even bigger crises like climate change ramping up, it doesn't seem like it will, the reaction will either be that of left-wing justified populism offering a solution or right-wing populism offering appeasement that doesn't change the rich's status quo. Given this, the rich will mostly align with the nationalistic right in order to keep their wealth 
But unlike previous historical crises, this climate one and the saber rattling of nuclear war are existential threats. They are crises that not only hold the fate of a few countries, but hold the fate of all of humanity in its control, which requires global cooperation, global unity, and a change to the current capitalistic status quo in order to get out of, not nationalism and sectarian conflict. I've shown four examples so far, two from the past and two from the present, that show the rise of these nationalistic if not neo-fascistic sects in the world today, along with the historical establishment of fascist governments in the past. And trust me, there are many, many other examples that I could have given. And while you may disagree with my view on this response by the rich to socialist movements, it undoubtedly seems that fascist groups are given funding and come to power when the ruling class is under fear of losing their prestige. Now, many people use the term third position when talking about fascism, saying that it's against both capitalism and communism. But the reality of the situation is that while fascists may claim this, the evidence just simply doesn't support this, with the ruling class entering into a loose alliance with them to save their wealth and status, knowing that fascism is perfectly fine with the rigid hierarchies that allow them to be on top, just in a militaristic model rather than a civilian model, which is the only real change. Fascism may be starkly opposed to liberal democracy, but the evidence simply shows that fascism and fascist states have always aligned with conservative movements, and they always use the host country's version of nationalism in order to come to power. Just take a look at the Nazis, aligning themselves with the previous Prussian militarist aristocracy, or look at Italy with Emmanuel III basically allowing Mussolini to take control of the state, as a clear preference over the elected socialists that were the biggest individual party at the time, when Emmanuel III could have easily called in the military to stop the coup, which his prime minister urged him to do. Emmanuel III became close with Mussolini later on and had multiple opportunities to stop his rise to power but did nothing. Or we could even look at Franco in Spain with him aligning with monarchists and every right-wing conservative that there was. All fascist governments align themselves with the political right in order to come to power. You can have an argument on their policies, but they clearly are way more preferential of the right than the left. In fact, they actively try to purge the left. For instance, in Franco's Spain, he went after all the socialists and communists that he saw in the government, and purged them during and after the Civil War. Or with Hitler, as I said in the beginning of the series, jailing 4,000 communist members and leaders, with him having socialists and union organizers sent to the first concentration camps. Or even the original fascist, Mussolini, who two months after he took over as prime minister, his fascists attacked and killed members of the local labor movement in Turin. And the later assassinations of socialist leaders would lead to a total takeover by Mussolini's fascist party, where he would imprison all socialist opposition. This is because fascism is the very embodiment of reactionary ideology. Fascism is a tool of the wealthy elite to stop a growing class consciousness vying for a breakdown of these hierarchies via socialist policies in order to have a redistribution of the wealth, however big, thus making the rich in general resort to an uneasy alliance with fascists, because they know the alternative is a breakdown of their unjust hierarchies. And while they may not like fascism and prefer liberal democracy, the majority of those with a vast amount of wealth know that with fascism they can at least maintain a hierarchy, and keep their wealth as long as they don't speak out against the state, and even profit from it. Fascism is a physical embodiment of hierarchy, and the leaders are despots that promise that their nation will be better to their group. They create an other and divide the people, so they don't question these hierarchies, similar to how the rich divide workers from working together. That's why these groups can get along and support each other. The rich and fascists in these systems free themselves, but they enslave the people. They regiment your lives, tell you what to think, and what to feel. We must reject that. Don't give yourselves to these wannabe tyrants. Break down these national barriers and realize that we are all one people, and we all have one world to protect, for all. Not just for those who steal and hoard power and wealth. The workers of all nations have way more in common with each other than with the wealthy elite. Thank you all so much for watching this video, and thank you so much Kaylee and Scott for your help on the script. The next video will be a little different and in a documentary style, so please look forward to that. More information on that in the comments below. Also, I have a Patreon now, and any little bit helps, and I appreciate the support. So for as low as the cost of a Coke can a month, you can get your name in the outro of my videos, along with other benefits. If you can't afford Patreon, that's perfectly fine. Just please go ahead and like, subscribe, and share my videos if you enjoy my content content. Anyways, love you guys. Bye.